So maybe you've been here the last several weeks, maybe this is your first time ever here. What we've done is we've been going through a book in the Bible called Colossians. It's a, it's a book written by the Apostle Paul to a, a church in Colossae where now there's not even a city. But back then there was a church there that was impacted by the ministry of Paul. A man named Epaphras has got, had gotten saved under Paul's ministry, went back home to his town and started a church with other believers. And so what we see here is it's, it's later on now. Uh, Epaphras has come to visit Paul in Rome. Um, Paul is on house arrest, and Epaphras comes, tells him what's going on at the church, and Paul pins this letter to the church and sends it with a couple guys to go deliver it to encourage them on what God's doing there and make sure that they stay on track. And so we've seen that, as this series is called, it's Colossians, but the, the subtitle is It's All About Jesus. And so the first two chapters took us six weeks to get through because we really wanted to nail down how Paul does in every one of his letters, how that the first several chapters and, and sometimes most of the book is just him explaining who God is and what that means for us. The beauty of the story of the gospel. So for six weeks, we've talked about the, the, the full deity of God found in Jesus, that Jesus is above everything, that is Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That we're not saved by religion or, or philosophy or psychology or, or rules and regulations. That our focus, our everything is Jesus. And so today it shifts gears as it does in most of Paul's letters. That after he tells you over and over and over about Jesus and who he is and what that means. That all of a sudden he'll just go into application. He goes from, you need to understand this. Like, let's make sure that we're clear that you've been taught right doctrine, that you really know who God is and what that means for you. And then all of a sudden it just shifts gears and he says, like, now apply it to your life. And so that's where we get today. And the reason that I needed to say that to start is because if you just came in today and, um, and caught how it says you should apply all these things to your life, it might feel like rules and regulations. If you just heard, like, what you're going to hear today, like put these things to death and change these things and get rid of these things, you might feel like, whoa. Because you need to first have the view and understanding of how glorious our God is that when we were dead in our sins, broken and separated from him because of rebellion in our own lives, because of the sin in the world, that he died for us because he loves us so much. And I hope that you've come here today already accepting that. If you haven't, then I hope you do by the time you leave today. And that it kind of shifts from there. So Paul now at this point is understanding that you've read half of the letter he wrote. And that now we're getting into, okay, now that you've received the fact that there's false teaching among you. And people are trying to get you caught up in all of this other stuff in the world. And now that you see that it's all about Jesus, let's go head on into how that should affect our lives. So I'm going to read a fairly large chunk of scripture and then we're going to go through it. And um, you need to take off your watches and put them in your pocket and hide your cell phones because the clock is off. I don't know if you noticed that. Um, it took the reins off. It's, it's go time. No, I, don't worry. I, I got a clock. Um, so let me read this. It's Colossians 3. 1 through 17 says this. Actually, before I read it, if you're taking notes, um, the series title I have right here to, for today, or not the series, but the message title is Reborn Identity. Catch that reborn identity, uh, and kind of an idea of like, who am I and who are you? So here we go. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices." And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. 
Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, uncircumcised or, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you, oh, excuse me, and forgive one another if any of you has grievances against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the peace of Christ, excuse me, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whew. This is awesome. What you're going to see today is a game changer in your Christian walk. It really is. It's a game changer. Because what it talks about and what we'll see here today is a new perspective and, and you understanding who you are based on who he is and what most people go through their life seeking is an understanding of who they are. You ever met somebody that knows who they are and they're sure of who they are and they're walking in that? Don't they just act a little different than everybody else? There's a little bit more confidence in them. Or you find somebody that like understands the purpose that they're built for and they're living it out. You see the joy that's in them. Not that everything's perfect, but they're living in a way that feels fulfilled. And most people on earth are unfulfilled and can be swayed by any wind of culture that might promise some sort of fulfillment because they want to know, who am I? Maybe if I do that, I'll find me. Maybe if I look into that, I'll find me. And so it's easy to start looking into different religions or philosophies hoping that if I can find something in there to justify how I already feel in myself, I'll feel good and settled. But today what we look at is in view of how mighty and amazing God is, the only way to have a true perspective of who we are and a fulfillment in walking that out is to ask the Creator. And when we understand Him and start to understand who we are in view of that, we can start to walk out the life that he has for us. Huh. That's exciting, if you're wondering. If you're taking notes right, new view. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that means everybody that's in Christ, that person is a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. What does that mean? Uh, what we've looked at for the last six weeks is just how awesome Jesus is. That You cannot be saved by your own works, but you are saved by works. It just happens to be the ones that God did for us, not the ones you do to try to please him. And that by accepting the works of Jesus Christ, putting your faith in, your trust in him who is alive and sits on the throne, you have salvation. That's awesome. And so now we come to this, and, and we see that you're a new creation, you're a new you, and so how do I think differently, be different, feel different, because that will shape the way I walk things out. If you only hear uh, behavior modification, um, then it starts to feel like religion, religion, you'll have a pushback, you'll want to rebel. That's kind of how we're built. Like, don't tell me how I need to act. And it's problematic because you can start blaming God or blaming people that love him and love you um, when they're trying to help you with alignment. That's why we have to speak to the heart issue of things. That's why there's two chapters built on, like you need to understand how amazing God is, that you've died with him, that you've been raised again, that your heart has been circumcised, the flesh removed, that, that you could be in connection with God. Huh. So we understand that we're a new creation if we've given our life to Jesus. And so we're going to walk through these 17 verses, some of them in chunks and some of them one at a time. Um, and, and so this first four verses are going to be under the title of New View, but the first verse is just your heart setting. It says, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. 
Now, when it talks about your, your heart in Scripture, it's obviously not talking about your physical heart. It's talking about, like, their understanding then would be kind of the emotional bowels. <laughs> Might sound kind of weird. You ever had heartbreak? You ever lose somebody, either a relationship or a person in your life, that you literally, you literally felt the pain inside of the brokenness of emotion? You're like, wait a second, if that's emotional, how come I feel that physically? That's, that's the emotional bowels. It's the heartbreak or the heart ache that goes on on the inside. It's the deep level of emotions. It's the core affections that we have. And so what we see here is it says, since then you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above. Set your affections, your longings, your core self, your desires, your deep self above. And when it talks about setting, I want to kind of think of it kind of twofold. See, because when you set something somewhere, I mean, you could, you could take something and, and set it somewhere. We understand it like that, right? Like you're cleaning your house. You pick something up, you set it somewhere, and you forget about it. You don't mean to, but then you start doing something else. And later you're like, oh, man, where did I? Um, men don't do that as much as women. But um, <laughs> I think it's scientific. But uh, yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> Don't be mad at me. Um, so I want you to think of it kind of twofold. I want you to think of it, one, as like my heart being set on things above, that my heart is set in the presence of God. That, that's where things change. That's where we get a new perspective. I want my passions, I want my desires to be lined up, to be set at, I want to be at like 10,000 feet looking down, not right here on everything. A lot of times our problem is we view things through the context of the emotions that we have based off the old life that we used to live before we had Christ. And so we're thrown all over the place because my heart's not set on heavenly things. My heart is set on everything. And so I want us to understand it two ways. Setting like, okay, I'm going to set my heart in the presence of the Most High God where he shapes and forms the emotions, the desires of my heart. And the second way is like if you set a thermostat in your house. How many know that's a setting? You set, a, you set a thermostat in your house, and you can set them, and you can dial them in so that if it goes over a certain temperature, it will bring it back down. If it goes under a temperature, it will bring it back up. That I would set my heart on Jesus, that if ever it starts to go outside of that range, it would start to pull back to and come into alignment with Jesus. That we set our heart in a different place. And so the problem is oftentimes what happens is um, we'll put our faith in Jesus, continue in our same thought processes, have an emotional connection to the same regular things that we had that we died to. And we try to base everything off of those and then wonder why I'm not walking things out the way that Scripture talks about. Huh. I don't know if you heard that. Your heart doesn't change because you put everything in order on the outside. Everything comes into real order on the outside when your heart's changed. So what we see here is, is the heart said, is since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Both the setting and the setting or dialing into. And the question to ask yourself then is, where's my heart? Where is my heart? Is my heart on worldly things? Temporal things? Or is my heart and my desires, my affections on eternal things? There's an easy way to kind of understand where you're at with that and when you come in contact with other people. Oftentimes what happens is we want to deal with situations based on a very limited uh, understanding of time frame and impact. And so I don't really care how it deals with right now because I just need to get something accomplished, not understanding that there's a bigger thing at play right now, regardless of the situation. That the eternity is at stake sometimes. Like sometimes we have the opportunity to help someone understand who Jesus is, but instead I'm too busy with all my affections of this world and how I'm viewed and how I look and how I've always been set in my heart. And so I'm going to deal with this on that level instead of having my heart set on in a different place and bringing things into alignment with who Jesus is and what that looks like in my life. Scripture says a couple things. Um, well, it says lots of things, but about this. In Mark 12, 29 through 30, Jesus is asked about the greatest commandment. He says, the most important one, this is the first one, answered Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. 
we're honest, we often have mixed loyalties or separate loyalties. And we talk about here often like Jesus over everything. Because the problem is, if, if you haven't already set Jesus over everything, then, then you're going to have a struggle when those loyalties come at odds with each other. It's going to be a war that shouldn't really happen inside of you, so you'll struggle about, should I do this, or should I do this, or sh- should I do, do what I feel like I want to do, or should I do what Scripture says? If you haven't already dialed in and said, my heart is on heavenly things, then you'll have a struggle when those things come up. Just to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. That's all of your affection, your desires, every part of you. And in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, it's an interesting um, thing. It says, where your heart is, your treasure is also. Excuse me. It says, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. My thought is just this. Paul says something interesting in Philippians chapter 3. He says, all of these things that I've lost, I count as nothing as if I would just know him. That everything here is worth nothing compared to being a part of his resurrection and knowing him. And how many know that most of us aren't there yet because all of these things mean a lot to us? You know, the saddest things is that uh, if our hearts aren't set in heavenly places, then oftentimes we'll see people that have, have started to follow Jesus, and when some sort of worldly opportunity comes up, they'll leave their faith to pursue an opportunity on earth that will die. Like everything here passes away. And so, it's, and I'm not saying that, that sometimes there's not opportunities that you should go after. I'm, uh, maybe you should take a job somewhere else, but still you need to go get engaged in a, uh, a healthy church and have authentic relationships and follow after Jesus. So setting our hearts on those things, and, and then just where's my treasure at? What do I treasure? Do I treasure Jesus? Do I treasure that relationship? So our heart set. Uh, next one is mind setting. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. It's your thoughts, your beliefs, setting them above. And I want you to think about it the same kind of way we just talked about with the twofold way of thinking of setting. Um, where's my mind? I always think of a song that usually Mo only knows my song references, but uh, where's your head at? Where's your head at? Um, uh, but like, where is my, <laughs> oh, don't worry. Three people got it, and it was way worth it for that, okay? <laughs> the rest of you just think I'm crazy, and that's okay. You probably thought that anyway. Where is my mind? How am I thinking through, through things? Where is my perspective? Do I have a presence perspective? Do I have a perspective that, like, I'm asking God to shape it when I'm in his presence so that I would see things the way that he sees things? Where's my head at? What are my thoughts about people? What are my thoughts? None of us are, have, have attained this, or maybe you have. You're much holier than me. But when I come in contact with people, like my first thought usually isn't like, man, I wonder if this person's saved and how I can show them the beauty of Jesus Christ and the gospel. Right? Usually we start thinking through all kinds of stuff about a person walking up to us before that ever crosses our mind. If we're just being real, we have all kind of like prejudice that start to come up, stereotypes that start to come up. Because my mind is set on things that I view things the way the world views things. I look at things with a mind that has been shaped by culture instead of kingdom. And so in this, you're seeing like, okay, you've been raised with Christ. And and part of being raised with Christ is like, In eternity, we'll be raised with Christ, but part of it is now. We have a relationship. The veil has been torn, Scripture says, that we can live in the presence of God so that now that we're with God, that our hearts and our minds should be there, that our deep emotions, the emotional bowels, and our thoughts and beliefs should be in a place that is in alignment with Him, that we would set our mind, set on heart. That's why reading the Bible is so important. Because like, we get a picture of who God is and it helps adjust and align us with those things. That we would set our hearts and set our minds and that we would set our hearts and set our minds. When your mind starts to go somewhere, that you'd be like, no, the thermostat's set. Bring it back. 
So that if I ever start to take anything away from Jesus, start to add anything to Jesus, it would bring me back to it's all about Jesus. Okay. Our mindset. Romans 12, 2. And and Romans 12 is a very similar place like where we're at now in Colossians 3 where Paul for 11 chapters has explained the gospel. And then in chapter 12, he shifts gears on you. And he says, like, therefore, in view of God's mercy, let us offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is our spiritual act of worship. Then it says this, do not conform any longer, or this, nah, sorry, the new NIV version doesn't say any longer. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, the common culture, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. If you've been following after God for a while, have you ever noticed that some of your perspective on things starts to change? Some things you thought were okay, even once you gave your life to Jesus and you said, yeah, let, let's, I'm going to glorify God, and then you still had all these tugs and, and, and all these pulls of past emotion and past things taught. And so someone would bring up an issue, maybe a hot topic issue, and, and you would be like, yeah, no, I love Jesus, but I think that should be fine. Because there was still a work to be done in, in, in your mind being set on Jesus and in your heart being set on Jesus. But as you started to walk it out, you started to have a different view of those things. Like, wait a minute, that's not how God sees them. Like, just because I've, I, I've kind of felt that way because that's the way man sees them, that doesn't, man doesn't always see things the way God sees things. That should be very clear. <laughs> 13 seconds into the news and you're like, ah! Maybe I'm the only one. Look at this in Romans 8, 5 through 13. It says this. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. Don't beat yourself up over this stuff. Some of you right now, when you see these things, you're like, oh man, I'm not even, like you can beat yourself up and feel like condemned because you're like, wait, I'm not as holy as I'm supposed to be. You're not, neither am I. Jesus is holy. He's righteous. He took all of our sin and gave us all of his righteousness that we can walk out a relationship with God as he's continuing to make us more holy. You don't have to be there yet. (laughs) But keep setting your mind, setting your heart. The mind governed by the flesh is death. Governed, ruled by. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, listen, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So let me just tell you something real quick. You might feel like your flesh runs you sometimes. That's just you still, you're still fighting with a dead man. You're dead to those things. We're going to see that in just a minute. You're just wrestling with a dead man. Um, If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, God drew you to himself, uh, gave you the faith to respond, and now has set his spirit inside of you, and you live in the spiritual realm. You are ruled by the spirit, even though you still maybe are working through fighting the flesh. So don't think like, maybe I'm not saved because I don't feel like every decision I make comes into the the governmental rule of the spirit inside of me. That's because you're not perfect yet. You will be perfect someday. But just have that be encouraging, that the Spirit of God lives inside of you, which means you're His. That's what matters. You're His. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh. To live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death, we're going to look at that in just a minute, the misdeeds of the body, you will live. This This is the shift. This is where we're headed. This is an understanding of belief system of who God is. Now understanding because of that, who am I? That my mind is in the right place, that my heart is in the right place, and that God starts to transform me because... He's the only one that can tell me who I am now. 
Okay. Verse 3 and 4. Oh, no clock. Perfect. (laughs) For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear appear with him in glory. Hmm. Think about this for a second. A new life can't be learned by old ways. Dead things can't teach about living. And the temporary can't give you eternal. So we have a problem when we start looking for who we are here. It says here, for you died and your life is hidden. That's kind of confusing, right? Am I dead or alive? Yes. (laughs) You're dead to the old you. And you're alive and it's hidden with Christ. And not hidden in the understanding of like how we think of hidden. Because we think of hidden as like hide and go seek or like somebody purposely hiding something from you. Um, it's, It's hidden in the sense that that's where it's found. That your life is found in Christ. Believe me, it's not hidden like, because if God wanted to hide it so you couldn't find it, you'd never find it. He's God. I know people that could hide stuff that you'd never find. If God wanted to do that, he could, but he didn't. Instead, he, he exposed, he revealed that it's all about Christ, that your life is found in him now that you've died to your old ways, that you've been brought to life through him, in him, for him, by him, and that that's where you find your new life. And, and, and so it's wrong of us to think that now that we've given our life to Christ, that we should go along, around looking for who am I in temporary things or from worldly views and from people here. Three of you are with me on that. It's hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is awesome. That means right now we find our life in him. Our everyday life should be found in him. We look to him to figure out how do I walk this thing out? Who am I? How, How does this all work? And then also we believe in a real resurrection. We believe that Jesus Christ is coming back in his glory and that those who have given their life to him and put their faith in him um, also have a resurrection body and and, and a a glorified body in that time. A perfect body. With no sin. So there's no sickness or death or disease. Praise him for that. Some of you woke up this morning like, ah! I was one of them, okay? Okay. Listen, in Ephesians 2, 4 through 7, it says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say, that's not future. That's not saying, okay, he's going to raise us up. It says he raised us up. That's why your life now is found in things not of this world. That doesn't mean you don't still walk through this world, but that means that that they'll be empty. If you try to find who you are in this world, it will be empty. That's why people that can be the most successful people on the planet, have the most things on the planet, can do things like take their own life. Because they looked in all of these things here and weren't satisfied. That's why uh, King Solomon in the Old Testament talks about like, I've had everything and it's all vanity. I just need to know you. Huh. That he raised us up and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. That God has a plan to show how amazing uh, and how Rich his grace is, incomparable riches of grace. He has a plan to show that in you as he reveals his son again and, and, and we're resurrected. How cool is that? That his plan to show how amazing he is is found in you. Like I'm going to show how awesome I am. I'm going to make you awesome. Okay, that excites me. Um. And check this out about the coming glory in Philippians 3, 20 through 21. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. 
Our citizenship is found in heaven. We're all like on a work visa. <laughs> I'm serious. Like there'll be a day when that time runs out. Some of us need to hear the word work in front of that. Um, on a work visa. So listen to this. Now that we understand who God is, that we set our hearts on things above, that we set our hearts uh, on him, that we set our minds on things above and set our mind on him, and that we're life seekers. We seek life. We don't seek it in other things of this world. We seek it in him, the only one that brought us life in the first place. If he's the one that gave it to us, isn't he the one that we should ask about how to walk it out? And so it it goes now into an awesome place. Um, If you're taking notes, right, get rid of what's gone. Get rid of what's gone. Maybe a subtitle for that in this next part is kill what is dead. Kill what is dead. Listen. This is aggressive language right here. Verse 5 says, put to death, literally, literally means kill. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. We just listen that we died. We were raised again with him. We're alive now. And what we wrestle with is the old dead us. We're literally wrestling with a dead man. And so what we see here is he says, put to death whatever. He's going to give us a list, but that word whatever makes that list not complete. It makes it much bigger than the list he gives us. It's whatever belongs to the earthly nature. And then it goes down this list, and and it says sexual immorality. I should probably define some of these as we go through them very quickly. Sexual immorality is sexual sin. Sexual sin is anything outside of the context of how God built sin, which is inside of um, uh, a man and woman in marriage, uh, that scripturally. And so right here, if that rubbed you wrong just now, even me saying that, um, the issue is where your mind and your heart is. Think about this. I'm not trying to offend anybody. If it does, I'm sorry. But if your heart and your mind are on God's view of things, then when something confronts you in Scripture, you see it as, okay, God, I'm trying to understand you better with where my heart is and my head is. Not, you must be wrong because this feels right. What you're doing is you're wrestling with a dead man. You're wrestling with a a dead culture. You're, You're wrestling with the things around us that have shaped and formed you to this time, but you no longer are called to live in those ways. And I don't just mean, like, some of you just heard that as, like, uh, going against, like, um, homosexuality or something. But that means any sort of sexual sin. Um, so we're talking fornication. We're talking adultery. Um, we're, we're talking uh, pornography. We're talking, like, the list goes on and on. It's a big catch-all statement, sexual immorality. Because it means anything outside of what was built for. Impurity, I don't think I need to explain that. Lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. I want to tell you something. A lot of your Bibles might not say greed. It might say covetousness. Covetousness, which is idolatry. Why is that idolatry? All of these things are idolatry because what all of these are are desires, desires for things outside of the boundaries of what God gave us. It's us wanting something that is forbidden or not ours. That's what sex outside of the context of marriage is. I want something that God forbid, but I'm going to do it anyways because I want it. And every time it takes me back to the original Charlie in the Chocolate Factory and the girl with all the candy (laughs) being like, I want the world. I want the whole world. I want to lock it all up in my pocket. It's my bar of chocolate. (laughs) Give it to me now. Oh, Anyway, I don't know many songs, but somehow I know that one. But that's how we are. Let's just be real for a second. God says, here's how I built things. And we say, God, you cheated me. So you can look at someone else's spouse and go, I wish I had that. How? What? 
Think about what we're doing. We're saying, God, you don't love me enough to give me what's best for me. You don't know better. I know better. You cheated me. It's idolatry. It's saying, I can play God better than you can. I'm a better God than you, God. Because if I was in charge, I would give myself over to all of these things on the lists that God knows kill us, that take us away from him, that separate. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, it, that's a scary place to live in because in Romans chapter 1, it talks about people doing these things that know better and that give themselves over to their own pleasures and desires and start to make it okay for other people to do so. And it says right there that God gave them over to it. If that's what you want instead of me, it's yours. Okay. Which is idolatry. That's why it's such strong language. You know why it says kill these things? Because these things are trying to kill you. You don't play with things that are trying to kill you. Right? You want to see a good example of why you shouldn't play with things that are trying to kill you? Look at some of the animals people have tried to tame that turn on them eventually. Oh, it'd be great to have some tigers for my act. Oh, I think I should go live with bears. It's funny, except for you do that with sin. Like, I could deal with this. I could handle it. Yeah, I don't know if I want to put it to death because I don't, I don't know. I, like, I kind of like having it around. It's kind of what I'm used to. It's what I'm used to. No, the old you is dead. The dead you is used to it. Let's just go ahead and put a bullet in the dead you. It's already dead. Don't feel bad. You don't have to feel bad. It's dead. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. Can I just tell you something? Um, in verse 4, it said that Jesus is coming and then you'll like see glory because you'll be resurrected. This is like the other side of that same verse. Jesus is coming. You're either going to be glorified with him in glory or you receive the wrath of God. And that's scriptural. Like that's the, we just read that in the Bible. Um, so sometimes in our current culture, people like to dumb down or get rid of the wrath of God. Like there's not that part of Scripture. I don't know how you can just filter that out. Like there is no hell or there is no um, wrath that, that comes with separation from him. Um, there is. And thank God we don't have to experience it. And it's our job to tell other people that they don't have to either, that they can be reconciled to God through the work of Jesus Christ. You guys still with me? Clock says I got all kinds of time. <laughs> so, yeah. Listen, to, listen to, to Jesus here, and I, th I hope this makes more sense in view of Colossians 3, that maybe this verse in uh, Matthew 16 will make more sense now. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life from me will find it. That's the idea. Like the idea is you're probably doing one of two things. You're either probably putting a bullet in the old you or you're like doing CPR. That, that put to death, like deny those things and pick up your cross. And whoever wants to find their life needs to just lose it. And whoever loses their life will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. And that's not to say that you get to go to heaven based off works, but have I put my hope in Jesus? I guarantee you, like some people will say, like, yeah, you just need to put your faith in Jesus. That's true. For salvation, it's accepting the grace that he gave with your faith. I just... I, it's hard for me to believe that if the Spirit of God has come to dwell inside of you, that shouldn't produce some sort of change. 
Like scripture says the old you died and the new you is uh, uh, alive and, and moving like, and living and, and walking these things out. We should look different. Okay. So kill what is dead. Get rid of what is gone. I'm going to move fairly quickly through uh, a couple things here. Because I see out of the corner of my eye a keyboard player coming up. <laughs> but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. We should get rid of these things. Uh, kind of the idea, and we'll see it more in just a moment, is, is taking off clothes, um, getting rid of them. So it's, it's, it's kind of killing the first list and removing the second list. Not just to remove it and put it in your closet for the next time you put it on, but it's like a full removal. Some of you struggle with that maybe with your own closet. I, I've had clothes that are hard to get rid of. In fact, my wife one time made a deal with me. Well, tried to make a deal with me, and then I was on to her. And some pants that I definitely shouldn't have been wearing. But um, <clears throat> if you really want to get a kick out of it, they were um, the brand. No, they were Outcast. The rap group, Outcast. When I worked at Mr. Rags in the mall. Just giving you guys some perspective of the dead me. The way I put a bullet in them. So my wife, I love her to death. She's so sweet in her way to try to make me um, not look dumb. Um, she said, hey, babe, I was just wondering, is there anything in my closet that you'd like to me to get rid of? Like me to get rid of? It's kind of a weird request. No, because then you're going to replace it, and that'll cost us money. I'm not, <laughs> and I was like, well, what do you mean? She was like, oh, I was just thinking, like, maybe you pick something that you don't really, you know, like that I wear, and I'll pick something that I don't really like that you wear, and, <laughs> and we can just kind of lay those things to rest at the same time. <laughs> Listen, looking back, I understand why she was making that decision. <laughs> it's fully justified. Um, but she was trying to help me because it was hard for me to let go some things that I had. Even though I took them off, most of them may be wearing them as often. Um, they were still in there just in case. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> just in, in case. Broke out some Tims and a jersey or something. But <laughs> Preach. Uh, rid yourself of all such things. Listen to these. A lot of these things are things that, that overflow and come out of your mouth. The majority of these things are things that come out of your mouth. Listen. Anger, rage, malice, which is like an evil intent. Slander, filthy language from your lips, and lying to each other. Get rid of those things. Why? Listen. If you're taking notes, right, new spring. But in James 3, 9 through 12, it says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in, his, in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Some of us just need to understand something. When it's saying to change these things, it's still an inside-out kind of deal. The reason that we shouldn't uh, continue to spit out salt water is because we have a new spring. Like a heart has been changed. Uh, God gave us a new heart. Uh, the old hard heart we had has been removed and replaced, and we have a new spring inside of us that should produce in us a new kind of water. That doesn't mean that you won't slip. That doesn't mean that you won't still sometimes say something you shouldn't. Hopefully now you've grown enough and matured that you'll go repent for that. Hopefully it's not as often anymore. But not because somebody told you you have to to come into alignment with what we say. But because the spring is different. It should start producing new water. So what it says here is like put to death those things that... that are kind of the impurities of your heart that are covetousness, that are idolatry, and also get rid of those things that would be destructive towards other people that, that used to come out because of the, the wrongness of your heart. And in fact, in, in Matthew, Jesus talks about that the, what comes out of your mouth is out of the overflow of your heart. Your heart has been changed, though. Let's have a new overflow. Can you guys hang out for just a couple more minutes? I don't know why I ask. I'm going to keep teaching. 
getting rid of what's gone and being who we are. Being who we are. If we could understand this perspective, I, I just know it would be a game changer for every single Christian. If we would just really understand who we already are. We wrestle with an identity that has already been set. And so some people can like give their life to Jesus, put their faith in him, start, start just trying to walk with him and then start wondering like, does he love me? Am I still condemned? Am I right? Like those things are already established. The promises that God has for you in Christ are all yes and amen. Being who we are in Philippians 3.16 says this, only let us live up to what we have already attained. I love that verse. It's the already, not yet. Let us live up to what we've already attained. Let us live up to where we're already at. So if my mind is set in heavenly places, if my heart is set in heavenly places, if I'm righteous because of what Christ did, let me only live up to what I already am. I'm not trying to be something I'm not. How many know how stressful that is? There's a line that I'm sure I'll slaughter in the movie Hitch. I ruin every line of every movie, but I do love that movie. Um, where he's the dating advice guy, whatever. And at the beginning of the movie, this, he told this guy how to dress. And the guy comes to him and he's like, oh, I don't know about these shoes, man. They're not really me. And he looks at him and he's like, what does he say? You is, you is a, a, a fluid term. Thanks, babe. My wife remembers every line of every movie. I don't know how she does it. You is a fluid term. What's he saying? He's saying like, no, you, you are what you, who you are. And so we need to just understand that. Like some people will say like, oh man, like that's just not really me. I'm like biblical matters. Yeah, but I just don't really sit there. I don't really agree with that. Like you, you, it's a fluid term. Like you aren't the dead you. So I, I don't know. Just help me understand where you're basing your identity of who you are now. Because my Bible makes it clear on who we are. We don't use that to judge people, or, or, but just it helps me with a, a perspective of like, no, who I am. If you think of it like sports, um, there's something that happens about guys that know they're good shooters and are confident in that. Because when they miss, they say like, that's not me. I make shots. And so they're willing to just keep shooting. And you can see it on them. They're just like, they just, that's who they are. And then there's people that aren't quite as confident. They don't know if they're really built that way. They miss a couple and start going like, ah, maybe I shouldn't be the guy shooting because I don't know if I shoot that well. Okay, three of you have ever played basketball before and understand that analogy. <clears throat> that's okay. <laughs> I'm getting everybody here though. I go Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory over here. I go shooting hoops over here. Who knows what's next? Living up to what we've already attained, the new image, Colossians 3.10 says, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Listen to this in 2 Corinthians 3.17 through 18. It says, now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. That means as we spend time with him, we start to reflect his glory and we're being made more and more like Christ with ever increasing glory. We're being perfected and, and only when he comes or when we go to him will we be perfect but that we're constantly being perfected. How? By being in his presence, by getting a right perspective, by putting our hearts and minds in heavenly places. Okay. These are coming out like uh, machine gun style, these next couple of points. We're being changed into the image as we stand in front of Christ and we start to reflect his glory. If you're taking notes, right? Lookalikes. Colossians 3.11 says, Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. The beauty of the church is its unity in diversity. Listen to me. Let me just tell you that, that how different church is than everything else in the world. In that day, there really were 
slaves and free. And that day, when they're talking about barbarians and Scythians, like Scythians were known for, like some of their kind of like, oh, the Scythians, where they were like the most wicked people on the planet. They were known for like, oh, they'll, they'll kill everyone and use their skull as bowls. <laughs> and he says, oh, no, them, they're just like the Jews and the Gentiles and the slaves and the free. And how crazy is that? That regardless of all of where we started, we come here and look alike in Christ. And that's not to say that we don't have differences of, of, of cultural background and, and, and some tradition, but church is the only place, and in, in that day and now, where, like in that context, a guy could be a slave owner, come into the congregation, and a slave was equal to him. His own slave could be his slave at home, come to church and be equal to him. To him. In fact, if the slave had the, the, the gift of teaching, he could go up here and preach a message from the gospel to his slave owner. Like, no, this is Jesus, and this is how you should live. What? How many know that's totally against culture? Like, that's totally against, church is the only place that kind of thing happens. Why? Because what happens in Christ, when we put our faith in him, we all are, the sa- are, are on that same level. Like, we all come in here the same. We were sinners. We were dead. We're made alive in Christ. And now Christ is in all, and he's the equalizer for us, that all of us come in here worshiping him. Not worthy, but made right. And so you literally could come here with your boss, and you could have a leadership role over them. That could happen. That you could come here and, and be at odds with, uh, maybe you came up in a home that, that had some sort of uh, wrong view of culture in the sense of like racism or something. But you come here, like I believe wholeheartedly that the church should be like the best, most beautiful looking, diverse and united place on the planet. I believe that church should be a, a cross section of culture. I believe that wholeheartedly. What do I mean by like a cross section? I mean that people from every area of walk of life in our community should feel free to come here and worship. Everywhere, socioeconomically, um, uh, ethnicity, culture, background, context can come here. And if Jesus is what we're going after, then we do it together. And we don't look at all those things as barriers, just beauty of how God can work all of this together for his glory. How cool is that? Oh, that was supposed to be machine gun style. This is a really, it's, it's getting stuck. <laughs> Lookalikes. Now listen to this one. This is kind of fun. Christian fashion. Christian fashion. When I say we look alike, I do not mean our clothes, our hair, our style. I mean that we're all being conformed to look like Christ. Regardless of where we start, we're all being transformed into the image of Christ. So we all should start looking more and more like each other and that way. Therefore, as God's chosen people, that's awesome, he chose us. Holy, which means set apart. He chose you and set you apart. And dearly loved, he adopted you. He loves you. Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now consciously, we put it on on the outside, but realistically, for that to be real and long-lasting, that comes from the inside. In Galatians 5, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit and gives a very similar list. That as our heart changes, it should affect the way that we interact with each other. That we should clothe, we should clothe ourselves with those things. Not just you, but all of us. We're being who we are. This should we, be a, we should be a grace conduit. Colossians 3.13. Bear with each other. That means endure together. You ever met somebody that's like cool with you in good times, and then when bad times come, they're like gone? Like sometimes you don't know your friends until hard times come. Then who's willing to just grind it out with you? And really there it says, as believers, we should bear with each other. That if you're going through something, you're not enduring it on your own. That you're enduring it with the body of believers, with the family of believers. And forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance with, against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Just give what you got. I can't get into all that right now, but there's some awesome places in Scripture that help us understand the indebtedness we had to God and how much he forgave and how it's only right for us to give that kind of forgiveness to other people. It does a beautiful work in building relationship and fixing relationship. It also does a sweet thing inside of you to give you a peace 
instead of getting embittered and, 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 and frustrated and letting that rule over you. Love covering in Colossians 3.14 and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. I'm not going to read through it right now, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the whole chapter talks about love. And maybe you've heard part of it at a wedding before. Um, love is patient, love is kind. It goes through that list. Before that, it's kind of sandwiched in <clears throat> to the place of spiritual giftings in the New Testament. Um, and, and this part is awesome. At the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it, it says that, that if I speak in tongues of, of angels or of men, but have not love, I'm a gong. I'm a symbol being hit. How crazy is that? If I give everything away to the poor and, and do harsh treatment to keep me into alignment to show how great I am, um, how great of a follower I am, but I have not love, it was all for nothing. That love is the difference maker there. That if I do all those things without love, then I have did them for myself. I did them for my own payback, for my own glory. I missed the point. But then when I do them in love, someone gets blessed. I get the awesome opportunity to have God work through me, and he gets glorified. That all of these things that it says, kill these things, put on these things, and, and over the compassion and the kindness and all those humility that you put on, put love over all of it like a belt that you would cinch together and hold all your different layers together. Mm. And my last main point is just to be Jesus-soaked. That might sound weird, but we've put to death the old, gotten rid of the old and, and put on this new all through a perspective of who we are in God and that we should be just covered in these new clothes. It's like just soaked in who Jesus is. 3.15 says this, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Just wonder in your hearts, is, is the peace of Christ the ruler of your heart? Who rules my heart? If you don't have peace in your heart, it could be a matter of who's running it. Who rules it? The Bible talks to us about not being anxious about anything, but by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, bringing our requests to God. And it goes on and says, um, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts and then be word dwellers. It says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. How cool is that? The message of Christ, the word of Christ, the gospel should rule amongst us, or, dw or sorry, dwell amongst us richly. That it should be infused in conversation, in relationship, in everything about us. And that doesn't mean you can't talk about what's going on, other things that are happening in the world. It just means that, that it should be a main focus of who, as, of who we are. I mean, have the conversations about your fantasy football team or have the conversations about, I don't know, maybe you play games over at the Olympic card and comic shop. I don't know how you get down. Have those conversations, but make the gospel, make Jesus, like let's let that dwell amongst us richly that while we're doing those things, while we're enjoying fellowship and friendship and authentic relationship, that the gospel is the driving force, that the beauty of who Jesus is, that we would teach and admonish with all wisdom as the message of Jesus Christ dwells amongst us richly. And then it goes on and says this, which is pretty cool. Through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. <clears throat> what that means is uh, in a learning way, do you know that songs are very good to help you learn things? You don't believe me? Tell me your ABCs. Without song. It feels weird. Because you feel like you should start going A, B, C, D. Right? Some of you, maybe you grew up in like a, um, a church, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sunday school? And so like maybe you know the New Testament. But you know it as like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, and then there's Romans. Did that not help you? Even the worship songs we do should be biblically and doctrinally accurate so that when you leave here, you're humming. It's helping you, like the words of the song are helping you. It's teaching and admonishing and bringing you into alignment with who God is. And how many know there's something powerful about music in the first place? 
singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Some of you that have a problem when we do worship, you're like, ah, I don't want to sing, I feel uncomfortable. Like that verse should just help set you free. Go ahead and sing to him. And lastly, verse 17, and whatever you do, say whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is an awesome chunk of scripture. This book, it's, it's only four chapters long, although it's going to take us eight weeks or whatever to get through. Um, nine weeks, ten weeks to get through. I might just be adding them on we're sitting here. But it's so powerful because it lets us know that, that the pressures I felt from other people or felt from religion, like I have to conform to external modification, that, that I have to do A, B, and C, um, that I can get rid of that. That it's not about the, the current word of the day. It's about the word that became flesh and dwelt amongst us. That it's all about Jesus. His, who he is, what he's done. Uh, we come into alignment and follow after his teaching, not to earn salvation, but because we have it through what he's done. And in view of that, with my heart and my mind set on those things, then I start to kill the old me, take off the old ways, put on the new ways, cinch it up in love. That together we would walk this thing out in authentic relationship as all of us look from all different types of backgrounds are being transformed into the image of Jesus. That whatever is the overflow of our lives, whether in word or in deed, all of it will be done for him. This is what we're going to do right now. We're going to worship. As we do that, there's going to be buckets that pass by. Um, there are four of these two things you got when you came in. The Connect card. Uh, I hope you got a chance to look at it, maybe fill it out. On the back, it's, it's my next step today. I just believe that when you hang out in the presence of God and, and get into his word, he starts to draw you to himself, and maybe there's a thing he's asking of you. The only reason you put it on here is so that we can just be a partner in what that looks like. The bottom is prayer requests, praise reports. Um, let us praise with you and be excited for what God's doing. Also, let us pray with you if you're going through something right now. And then lastly, if you came ready to give today, uh, as the buckets go by, you can just drop that in. Let me pray and let us worship together. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. God, we thank you for your scripture that you speak to all of us, Lord God. And I just pray that we would get a new perspective, a perspective of us that you have, that we are made righteous by what you've done. God, let us only live up to what we've already attained. God, I thank you for every single person here. I thank you that as a congregation, you're doing a work inside of us, and individually, you're doing a work inside of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, let's worship together.